Welcome to the ninth annual Life Sciences and Society Symposium Claiming Kin. And uh, thank you to you for being such hearty early risers on this uh, weekend morning um, and joining us from the very beginning. We have a wonderful lineup today. Um, my name is Stephanie Engelstein. I'm the director of the Life Sciences and Society program. And as many of you know, because I recognize you from previous uh, um, events and many of you are, are faithful um, symposium comers, uh, the LSSP is an interdisciplinary program that's really interested in the many ways in which uh, the life sciences are part of the um, culture that they work within. Um, that they're also uh, cultural phenomena themselves, and we're interested in all of the various ways um, that the life sciences impact society and are affected by society. Um, we're also interested in connecting uh, the community to uh, the community of scholars and making sure that there are ways for us to uh, meet each other and talk to each other about issues that interest all of us. And one of those interests, uh, one of those issues um, is something we'll be talking about this weekend, and that's kinship. I'm really personally very excited about the topic of kinship for this weekend's symposium because it's something that I work on and therefore, of course, I think it's very significant. But um, one of the great things about kinship is that it's really, uh, an encapsulation of the kinds of things that we try to do in the Life Sciences and Society program because it uh, features so clearly uh, both cultural and biological elements. And it brings together the way that we um, uh, use uh, a, a sense of connection um, with something that we see in this culture as biological to identify ourselves and to form our relationship our relationships uh, with loved ones and to, to actually anchor um, our relationships in society. Um, I want to mention something that I actually said in the introduction last night as well, um, partly as an introduction to the symposium, but partly also, I think, as a, a clarification of a word that will continue to come up uh, all weekend and which we have different understandings of. And that is the word kinship itself, which in the hard sciences is a word that's synonymous with genetic relatedness. This is something that I actually only learned relatively recently in the last few years uh, because I'm used to the humanities definition and also the common cultural definition of kinship as um, belonging to a set of family associations that are recognized by a culture, right? So. Um, this is a word that we, that we still use here in Missouri, maybe more than in some other places. Uh, I was on jury duty a few years ago, and um, the jury was being questioned uh, by the judge to see if we should, should be able to, um, to stay there for the trial. And one of his first questions was whether anyone in the box was kin to the defendant. Because in a town this size, nearly always somebody is. And in fact, there was somebody there who was related to the defendant and had to uh, get up and leave. So. Um, <laughs> Um, that was, it was sort of an interesting moment because it also showed how the, the kinship um, we assume initiates a kind of bias, right? Which is part of what some of the speakers will be talking about today. So we're going to hear some wonderful talks this weekend um, about both the way that um, family constellations change across cultures and over time, and about some of the commonalities in the way that we think about our relatives, the way that we think about our kin across human uh, populations and even across species populations. Um, I, oh, my, uh, my slides show stopped uh, running, but um, I, I had wanted to uh, point out that um, we have a wonderful schedule for today and for tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll be in Monsanto Auditorium uh, in the Life Sciences Center uh, starting at 9 o'clock. And um, I want to thank everybody who made this symposium possible. Uh, that includes our wonderful list of sponsors and partners. Um, our sponsors include Mizzou Advantage, the School of Medicine, the Journalism School, the Bond Life Sciences Center, Kafner, the College of Arts and Science, the School of Law, um, the Chancellor's Distinguished Visitors uh, Program, um, the MU Libraries, and um, our partners in the community also include Ragtag, um, PS Gallery, and uh, then back on campus, Ellis Library. And I wanted to mention, particularly, you saw some of the slides running through, that Ellis Library and PS Gallery have exhibits that are related to the symposium that are still ongoing. And I uh, encourage you to, to go and take a look at them because they're really fascinating exhibits. In the one case, PS Gallery, art on the theme, it's all relative. 
And in, um, at, at Ellis Library, there's an exhibit uh, called Kindred Kingdoms about the way that early, in the early modern period, uh, humans imagined their relationship to fauna and to flora. Um, so I want to introduce my co-chair, uh, Mary Shank, who's from the Department of Anthropology and is going to introduce our first speaker. I also want to thank her um, for all of the wonderful work that she did. And I want to thank the planning committee as well, whose names you saw running here in the background. Maybe could the planning committee stand up? Come on, don't be shy. So, um, and here is Mary Shank to introduce our first speaker. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to introduce my colleague, Martin Daly, our first speaker of the symposium. Martin got his PhD in psychology from the University of Toronto in 1971, where he worked on the behavioral development of golden hamsters. As a postdoc at Bristol University in the UK, he went on to study the behavior of gerbils living in the Saharan Desert while doing fieldwork in Algeria and North Africa. In 1978, he appears to have discovered humans, beginning what would become a long career focusing on our species, though with occasional reference to deer mice, kangaroo rats, and rodents in general. Martin worked extensively with his colleague, Margot Wilson, and together they published a large body of work applying theory from evolutionary biology to the study of human kin and family relationships. Dalian Wilson's 1988 book, Homicide, used data from Detroit, Canada, and ethnographies from around the world to debunk the myth that people are more likely to be killed by kin than non-kin. 10 years later, Dalian Wilson's book, The Truth About Cinderella, A Darwinian View of Parental Love, focused on the treatment of stepchildren cross-culturally, arguing that in many senses, the Cinderella myth is based on reality. Martin is considered one of the key founders of the field of evolutionary psychology and a key figure in the evolutionary study of kinship. Martin spent most of his career at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, from which he retired in 2011, only to join the Department of Anthropology here at the University of Missouri last fall. He's currently working on a book about the relationship between inequality and homicide using data from around the world. With that, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Martin Daly. Hello, you have the uh, title, Kinship Mitigates Com Violent Conflict, I think, in the program. I'm going to come to that topic towards the end of my talk, but here's a roadmap of what I intend to do. I'm going to begin, first of all, with what might be called a bit of an introduction to um, social evolution theory, to the evolutionary theory of kinship. And I know many people in this audience will be familiar with this, but it's a broad audience, and many will not. And hopefully, even for the cognoscenti, I'll have something interesting to say. I will proceed from there to talk a bit about the topic of so-called kin recognition. That is to say, discriminative social response to individuals who present cues that they may be your relatives. And I'll talk about both some non-human and human examples, and also introduce briefly the concept of positive and negative relatedness rather than simply um, degree of relatedness from zero to one. And then at the end, I'll get to kinship mitigates violent conflict. So let me begin by saying, as Stephanie uh, hinted, that in evolutionary biology and evolutionary social sciences, um, we tend to one construal, at least, of the word kinship, not to say that people don't use it to encompass marital and adoptive relatives as well, but one construal is that kinship refers to relatedness in the genealogical and genetic sense. And so, by convention, two unrelated individuals, here's two guys who were born on the same day in 1809, um, who, as far as we know, have no traceable um, genealogical connections, and so by convention, their relatedness is zero. For clone mates, genetically identical individuals, um, including in the human case, monozygotic twins, um, some of you may recognize these particular twins who are a fairly formidable pair who 
won a $65 million settlement from Mark Zuckerberg for having stolen Facebook from them. Um, identical twins are considered to have a relatedness of one. And so on. For parent and offspring, or putative parent and offspring, um, R equals 0.5. Um, I, I say that only semi-facetiously, not to cast any aspersions on, on anybody, but uh, patrilineal links are more uncertain than matrilineal links in animals with internal fertilization, including ourselves. And on the assumption that uh, George H.W. is indeed the father of W, um, then the reason their relatedness is 0.5, if you like, one way to think about it, is that W got half his genes from HW, half his autosomal genes from HW, and the other half from some unrelated person, his mother, assuming that uh, his parents were not related to one another. Slightly more formally, we can define relatedness in this way. And here's a picture of Sewell Wright, famous American geneticist, um, usually considered responsible for the coefficient of relatedness that we use. And one definition, one intuitive, I think, or intelligible definition of relatedness, of Wright's coefficient of relatedness is this. The relatedness of two parties, persons A and B, is the probability that a randomly selected autosomal allele, that is to say, an allele from a chromosome other than a sex chromosome, um, in A's genotype, is also a component of B's genotype as a result of common descent from a share, recent shared ancestor. And this latter rider is important because, of course, many human genes are identical um, across everybody for reasons of there being no variability in those genes. Um, this is also referred to as the probability that the allele is, quotes, identical by descent, sometimes abbreviated even to IBD. Now, Darwin's theory of natural selection, with which I'll assume you all have some familiarity, explains traits as having been favorably selected and spread in populations and achieved their refinement and perfection because they promote the personal reproductive success of the individuals who have those traits. But without modern genetics, which Darwin knew nothing of, um, he really couldn't fully explain solidarity with non-descendant kin. He knew there was an interesting problem, and he had something of an answer. He was particularly exercised about cases like this. Um, social insects, these are, this is a species of wasp in which there will be a breeding female and a bunch of sterile workers. And Darwin understood that there was a problem in explaining how obligate sterility could evolve in, um, according to his theory of natural selection, which favored basically reproductivity. And he answered it in terms of the differential success of families of wasps. Um, but he took it not much farther than that. Who took it farther than that is Bill Hamilton, a British biologist, um, and to some degree some predecessors. Um, but uh, Hamilton's inclusive fitness theory is the expansion on Darwinism that introduced the idea that animals and plants, creatures including human beings, um, their fitness is not properly construed simply as their personal reproductive success, but as their impact on genetic posterity. And the argument is that so-called altruism, by which we mean costly helping, um, in evolutionary biology we mean, you know, there's no implication of intentionality as there often is in the ordinary English word altruism, but costly helping, and by costly I mean helping which reduces one's expected reproductive success, while increasing somebody else's, while doing someone else a benefit, can proliferate if it's sufficiently kin biased according to a rule. And the quant, or according to this inequality. And the components of the inequality are the cost incurred by the altruist. Note at the bottom, cost and benefit are in the currency of expected or average personal reproductive success. The cost incurred by the altruist and the benefit to the individual to whom the altruism is directed and multiplied by the relatedness 
between the altruist and the beneficiary in the coefficient of relatedness I've mentioned. And I think this formulation, Rb greater than C, can be made pretty intuitive if you just think of it. Imagine a novel mutation that inspired individuals to do something helpful for someone else. Could this mutation spread in a population or be maintained in a population? Hamilton's rule says, yes, it could, if the benefit is sufficiently large to offset the cost and the relatedness is sufficiently large, and the product of these two is an effect. The, you know, the cost is the cost to the new allele in forsaken reproduction. The benefit to that same allele depends upon the likelihood that the recipient also has it, which is R, times the benefit to the re recipient's reproduction. And if this inequality, if this condition is met, then selection can favor self-sacrificial or altruistic behavior. And another way to think about this is to say that this is a uh, construed, I think we owed a um, behavioral ecologist named Jerem Brown. Um, Jerry said one way to think about the inclusive fitness effect of an attribute, or for that matter, a gene, is to think of it as the sum of its effects on classical Darwinian fitness, that one's direct fitness through descendants, and indirect fitness through collateral non-descendant kin. For example, your full sister has a degree of relatedness of r equals 0.5. That full sister, that is, say, with the same parents. She's just as close a relative as your daughter. If you do something, if you perform some act that increases your sister's expected reproduction by a quantity x, it will increase your genetic posterity to exactly the same degree as if you had done something to increase your daughter's reproduction by the same amount. And by this argument, there's the, the paradox of why anybody would do something positive for others who are not their descendants or that would detract from their personal reproduction seems to be solved insofar as the positive impact is biased towards kin. So, in a sense, we can say that Darwin justified the idea that organisms can be thought of as reproductive strategists, that all their evolved attributes must ultimately if they are indeed functional, have been favored by selection, must ultimately contribute to personal reproduction. Bill Hamilton tweaked that conceptualization into saying that organisms are nepotistic strategists instead. And the word nepotism, as you probably know, um, here's a definition from the Oxford Online Dictionary, favoritism shown to relatives or friends um, which we do not mean in the present case, especially by giving them jobs, which we do not mean in the present case. The origin, interestingly, is that. Um, in evolutionary approaches to the social sciences, in behavioral ecology and evolutionary psychology and theoretical um, evolutionary biology, nepotism is now commonly used to mean any sort of systematic discrimination in favor of genetic relatives. And there's no pejorative inclination, there's nothing, you know, inappropriate about being a nepotist. Um, in fact, the evolutionary biologist Dick Alexander has said a number of years ago this, we should, we, and by we he means organisms in general, not just folks, should have evolved to be exceedingly effective nepotists, and we should have evolved to be nothing else at all. And what Dick means by this, he's using the wor word nepotism in the broad sense of promoting the well-being of relatives, both descendant and collateral, both descendant and non-descendant. And his point is that what selection can favor, and all that selection can favor, and our, therefore our evolved attributes, are contributing to the production, well-being, and eventual reproduction of genetic relatives. That's, that's all that organisms are for. That's all that their attributes can have been selected to accomplish. I have a picture I can't resist showing at this point. Um, I think it's taken in Evanston, Illinois in 1980, maybe 79. I think it was 1980. Um, 
some of the giants of contemporary evolutionary biology, or of the 20th century evolutionary biology, um, regrettably three of the five gentlemen in this picture are now deceased. On the far left we have Bill Hamilton, the architect of inclusive fitness theory. Um, next in from him is Dick Alexander, who's responsible for that quote I just showed you about, we should have evolved to be exceedingly effective nepotists and nothing else at all. On the far, far right, the tall gentleman, someone I haven't mentioned, George Williams, um, who is a giant of 20th century evolutionary biology. The um, white-haired gentleman in the foreground is Sewell Wright, at age 92, um, still as sharp as a tack at that point. Um, and the person in the middle, the sort of uh, swashbuckling young <laughs> dude, um, and the only person civilized enough to be wearing a tie, is Napoleon Chagnon, our own Napoleon Chagnon. I feel obliged to say a few words about um, controversies surrounding Hamilton's theory. It seems elegant and compelling to most people, but we have essentially had a half century now of ensuing, to put it politely, commentary. Um, efforts to debunk it, to um, improve upon it, to show its non-generality. And uh, there are a number of complications that, that explain this, I think. Um, one is the definition I gave you a while ago, and one that's commonly used, relatedness equals the probability that a random allele is identical in two parties as a result of common descent from a recent shared ancestor. Um, you may have noticed that the word recent is undefined in this definition. And what that means, in part, is, well, if you go back distally enough, everybody's related, how the hell do you know what the zero point is? Um, there is a complication in the definition of relatedness if it's defined that way. Also, relatedly, comparing the Darwinian or direct fitness as alternative phenotypes is at least in principle relatively straightforward. You have two types of individuals, you count the numbers of babies they produce, and you know which, uh, which one has a higher Darwinian fitness. Comparing their Hamiltonian fitnesses is trickier because if you're going to have direct and indirect fitness, you don't want to do double accounting of the impacts that one has on kin's fitness. You don't want to count that as to the credit of the altruist as indirect fitness and count the same babies as fitness of the uh, beneficiary. So you have to do some kind of discounting from personal fitness if you're going to do things that way. And so there's been various um, efforts to deal with this problem. And probably most importantly, you have the problem that populations are what's sometimes called viscous. Implicit in many applications of Hamilton's theory and many other evolutionary models is the idea that you have a population and that, you know, um, perhaps mating's random within it, but, but effects of um, the, the competitive effects of the success of one individual are distributed equally against everybody else and so on. Um, in reality, populations are viscous such that any fitness impact, whether positive or negative, of my actions on those around me is structured in space, and so is my genealogical relatedness to those around me. That, this too is structured in space. And this leads to various complications that have been dealt with through, on the one hand, um, group level and multi-level selection approaches, on the other hand, by various um, ways of adjusting R, adjusting the definition of relatedness according to the um, spatial decline of relatedness from the focal individual or the, you know, space may not even be the right dimension sometimes. I think it's fair to say that notwithstanding these complications and the fact that people have, you know, sort of reformulated Hamilton's rule, have sometimes drawn the conclusion that it's an approximation to something have, uh, most people have come to the conclusion finally that, <coughs> excuse me, that, how to put it, um, multi-level selection approaches and inclusive fitness approaches are two different accounting methods that are actually, um, can, each can be reduced to the other, that they're not, 
discriminable theories, and that I think it's an overwhelming consensus among evolutionary biologists that the inclusive fitness approach has been the most productive in inspiring, um, you know, A, that it's sound, and B, that it's been the most productive approach in inspiring the generation of testable hypotheses. So I am going to declare, um, and somebody may dissent, but I don't think it'll be very many people, that Hamilton's rule still rules, and that notwithstanding these complications, um, we can stop worrying about it. If you've heard that a prominent evolutionary biologist thinks Hamilton got it all wrong, and that this has been in the news, in the New Yorker, etc., cetera, um, know that this is a minority opinion and has been well refuted by many others, and I can give you references on that if you want. I want to make a little tangent to say a couple of things about the social sciences. Kinship is the central concept in Hamilton's theory, and arguably the, certainly a, central concept in theories of social evolution generally. I think it is no coincidence that it's also a central concept in anthropology. And in the case of anthropology, anthropologists made it a central concept because of what they found in field studies. There's, this, there's a lovely quote from Edmund Leach um, almost 50 years ago from an essay I admire called virgin, on the subject of virgin birth, um, which said, human beings, wherever we meet them, display an almost obsessional interest in matters of sex and kinship. And uh, I think that's a fact, and it has driven anthropology's great interest in kinship. And arguably, this is no coincidence that if social evolution depends on kinship, this has something to do with why people care about it. My natal discipline, if you like, is psychology. And I and a couple of colleagues wrote in a um, book chapter a number of years ago this sentence, um, the it being kinship. Given the importance of kinship in both biology and anthropology, one might suppose that it would have attained a central position in social psychology as well. And remarkably, it's been virtually ignored. And around that time, here, for example, is a distribution of what research reports in the leading social psychological journal were about um, at about the time we wrote this. This is the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. I've divvied up the um, relationship of interest in the research reports as strangers, friends or acquaintances, romantic relations, and genetic kin. And as you can see, virtually 80% of social psychological research at that time, in the leading journal at least, um, involved stranger interactions. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that psychologists are um, excessively um, fond of what they call parsimony, by which they mean they think that if they're going to have a sort of theoretical notion about social motives or social phenomena, it, can be invest it will apply to all relationships and can be investigated as readily in, among strangers as anywhere else. Um, there's also the convenience of an undergraduate subject pool where you bring people into the lab they've, and you know, they've never met each other and that's where you do your social psych experiments. And I think there's also a tendency to think that, well, real relationships between people muddy the water with complications. If I want to study pure social cognitive processes, the way to do it is in strangers. Um, if, as an evolutionist, you believe that, well, no, there is an evolved psychology of kinship and of heterosexual transactions and of various other things, then this seems kind of bizarre. At that time, the Journal of Social Personality and Social, social and Personality Psychology, Personality and Social Psychology, um, contained almost no um, research reports citing evolutionary theory and evolutionary ideas in particular. That's no longer true. There's probably at least a couple in every issue now. Um, but in some ways, the situation hasn't changed much. Um, here's the data from the same journal um, the last full year I happen to have. And yes, the preoccupation with stranger relationships has abated somewhat. There are only slightly over half of all reports now. Um, and largely because there is more study of friendship, same-sex friendships, and more study of romantic relationships, but interest in genetic kin has risen hardly at all. And I think it's a very surprising and regrettable thing 
that social psychology, which professes to be um, the science of social cognition and social motivation and social information processing, has shown so little interest in mother-child mother relationships, um, sororal and fraternal relationships, and so forth. A second little tangent that I'd like to do before moving on to the next part of the talk um, is to say a word about why I have avoided so far and will continue to avoid using the phrase kin selection, which is popular and used by many of my colleagues. And there's a couple of reasons. One is that the selection in kin selection, this term was quoted, coined, I believe, by John Maynard Smith um, around the time of Hamilton's theory being put forward by Hamilton. Um, the selection in kin selection is a statistical and historical process of past differentials of reproduction and genetic um, promulgation. It's selection in the same sense as Darwin's natural selection. But the word selection, unfortunately, is very close to um, selectivity in social response. And so kin selection is often misused in popular literature and occasionally in professional literature to refer to the nepotistic adaptations that presumably has evolved as a result of this selective process. And rather than saying people are engaged in kin by a selectivity of social response, you see people saying that, you know, kin selection is happening in the context in which somebody, you know, in the present generation is manifesting nepotistic discrimination. It's, there's a muddle between the historical process of selection as something that shapes adaptations and the adaptations themselves. The second reason I don't particularly like the term kin selection and try to avoid it is that it invites a further confusion, and that is that kin selection is some sort of level of selection intermediate between individual and group selection. And the reason this doesn't make any sense, if you think about it, is individual selection refers to the differential reproduction of types of individuals. Group selection refers to the differential reproduction, the differential survival and reproduction of types of groups. There's no analogous entities, kins, that are being differentially successful um, in kin selection. It's a different kind of theory than, it's not, it's not simply a level of selection, and yet um, this terminology seems to have invited that interpretation. And Bill Hamilton himself actually disliked the phrase kin selection for these and other perhaps more personal reasons um, and wouldn't use it, but he eventually gave up fighting it and appears in some of his late papers um, because it just had become so popular. Anyway, that's a tangential explanation of why I've tried to avoid it. Let me move on to the second part of the talk in which I want to talk briefly about the idea of kin recognition. And I have to begin immediately with a caveat, which is that Hamiltonian nepotism does not require any sort of kin recognition. And I'll give you an example. This is a prairie dog, which is really a squirrel. Many ground squirrels, many terrestrial squirrels, including prairie dogs, do something called alarm calling. They stand up on their hind legs looking around, and sometimes when they spot a predator, they, when they spot a red-tailed hawk come over a slight rise or something, they'll emit a call. And all the other ground squirrels who are out foraging might then run for their burrows. And arguably, alarm calling is an act of altruism that requires explanation. At the very least, it costs a minuscule amount of energy. There's some suggestion in some systems that it actually attracts the predator's attention to the caller and can be costly in that context. It clearly benefits those who hear it. And there's been a number of studies and a number of um, ground squirrels and other species of whether alarm calling is deployed in a way that can be made, you know, systematically in a way that can be explained by Hamilton's or other theories. And part of the reason for saying this is that you don't necessarily call. Sometimes ground squirrels are standing up and see a predator, clearly see a predator, orient towards it, dart down their hole while remaining mute. Other times they call, and so people have worked on the difference. Well, in the case of 
male prairie dogs, um, it's been reported that the rule of thumb by which males decide whether or not to call is basically before your testes descend, before you're mature, you call. Um, at maturity, you both disperse from your natal area and stop calling. Then, after you've settled somewhere else, after some period of time when you have become a sexually active adult in this new area and have some likelihood of having kids there, then you call again. And de facto, what seems to be achieved in this case, and you know, whether, whether or not this argument can be whinged at it, it gives the in-principle idea I want to convey here. Um, what seems to be achieved in this case is effectively nepotistic. Basically, the squirrels call when, in those circumstances in which those in the vicinity happen to be, have a high probability of being close relatives, and they shut up when they don't, during the life stage at which you don't have any close relatives near you. Um, there's no sign that the squirrels are making a discrimination with respect, that these particular squirrels, I'll, I'll tell you other stories in a minute, that these particular male prairie dogs are making any discrimination with respect to who their neighbors are. It seems to be just mechanistically a life stage thing. When you mature, you stop. When some other physiological transition happens, you start again, period. That said, that caveat expressed, Nepotistic discrimination, discriminative response in some way to particular individuals or to the presence or absence of kin, does require some sort of kin recognition. And we've still got recognition in quotes because that doesn't necessarily entail individual recognition in the usual sense. You know, there are cases described in social insects, for example, where differential admissibility into the colony depends on a chemical signature of being kin to that colony, but the guards who are admitting some and refusing to admit others apparently do not respond at all to the distinction between somebody I've admitted a ton of times before and somebody who is a first, you know, as a stranger, as a first time interacted. They respond to the kinship cue in both cases. You could say they're recognizing kin, but they're not recognizing individual kin. In complex organisms, um, like mammals, kin recognition often, perhaps typically, does entail individual recognition. And then there's interesting questions about how that is accomplished. How do discriminative nepotists, quotes, recognize their kin? And certainly one important class of cues that you can use are circumstantial cues. This can be demonstrated, this is a different ground squirrel. These are Belding's ground squirrels. Experiments have shown that um, if you cross foster individuals very young, then ground squirrels treat their litter mates more amicably than strangers, even if those litter mates are in fact fostered non-relatives. So in effect, you know, whoever was you know, on the other tip when I was growing up is my sibling. Um, pretty good rule of thumb. Um, there is evidence that human beings use such a rule to some extent. Um, and if you define circumstantial cues of kinship broadly enough, I might even include what you've been told about who your kin are in the human case as circumstantial cues of kinship. Distinct from that kind of cue is so-called phenotype matching, the phenomenon of assessing whether another might be a relative in terms of their phenotypic resemblance either to yourself or to known or presumptive relatives. And interestingly, in the case of these squirrels, they do another thing. They also treat genetic siblings who they have never met before more amicably than they treat non-relative strangers. So they seem to be responding to some cue of kinship that is not circumstantial over and above the circumstantial cue, most likely chemical cues. That, that seems like the leading candidate. And in fact, in a report um, more than 30 years ago now, Warren Holmes and Paul Sherman reported this very interesting result from these same species. Littermate squirrels may be half siblings, because a female during her estrus period may have mated with more than one male. 
as adults, sisters often literate sisters often occupy adjacent territories. And what Holmes and Sherman reported was that littermate full sisters fight less and assist each other more than littermate half sisters. Now these are females from the same litter who grew up together, then established territories adjacent to each other. Holmes and Sherman, after collecting all the behavioral observational data, then took blood samples and assessed who were full and who were half siblings and categorized them and sorted the behavioral data accordingly and discovered this. Um, it's not some, the sort of thing that's been reported very often. I love to see um, this phenomenon replicated in other animals. I'm maybe, you know, I'm, I'm not on top of recent animal behavior literature. Maybe somebody can tell me it has been. Um, but it's a very nice example of apparent um, adaptive discriminative response to something that can't be cued merely by circumstance. Well, maybe Fred Flamsall will tell me it could be cued by circumstance, because I suppose it's conceivable that full sibs are more likely to be adjacent in utero than half sibs and learn each other's individual identities before birth, but I kind of doubt it. Um, it's, an interest, it's an important discrimination, full sib versus half sib, r equals 0.5 versus r equals 0.25. It's, uh, it's a discrimination that it might often be kind of crucial for your inclusive fitness to be able to make. And these animals seem to be able to make it. In human beings, chemical cues, which are probably what's being used here, are, are certainly of relevance to kin recognition too. But this has really been shown primarily in the context of um, sexual attraction and inbreeding avoidance rather than in the context of discriminative nepotism. Where people have been interested in um, kinship cues in human beings includes something that you're not likely to see in squirrels, although you might, namely visual similarity and visual kinship assessment. And I want to talk about this briefly partly because some of my students have done some of this work and I, I like what they've done. Here is um, an approach to assessing self-similarity and its impacts on social behavior. You want to make a morph that between two faces that subliminally resembles the experimental subject. You can tell these, this is an old slide because this person in the middle is called a subject, where the, now that's politically incorrect and they should be called a participant um, in the research, but, uh, but we won't worry about that. The subject, um, a sort of prototypical subject, that is to say, a first-year undergraduate in a hoodie um, <laughs> comes to the lab, and then you have some other face, who in this case is referred to conventionally as the base face. You want to produce a morph of these two faces. Well, software um, has become better and better at doing interesting things of this sort. And in this case, what you want to do is you want to delineate all sorts of landmarks on the face, um, you know, the irises, the corners of the eyes, the corners of the mouth, various things, and then basically do a vector computation of the shape of the face and shift the base face a little bit or a lot in the direction of the subject face. Here you have a, I think it's a 50% morph, it might be a 40% morph, um, of the left-hand face towards the center face. Um, so the shape of the face, and only the shape. Nothing's been done to the color, the hair is left intact, etc. cetera. Um, but the face shape has been twisted a little bit to resemble the subject in the middle. And I hope you agree that it doesn't resemble the subject in the middle uncannily or particularly. And in fact, subjects in these experiments never say, wait a minute, that person looks like me. Um, that they, they don't have that reaction. But they do show some interesting discriminations. Um, the first good study of this phenomenon I know of was done by my student Lisa de Bryan. And Lisa did um, an economic game in the lab with real monetary consequences. And here's the form of the game, sometimes called a trust game, sometimes called an investment game. This terminology of trust that appears on the slide, by the way, is not given to the subjects. It's just you have these choices. And basically there's two players called P1 and P2. Um, P1 has two options, which I have called here, can trust P2 or not trust P2. X, the quantity X here can be some fixed amount. It's different in different trials of the experiment. Let's say it's three bucks. 
If it's three bucks, then P1 has the option of saying, we each get three bucks and we're going home, or kicking the decision along to um, player two. Player two then has the option of either saying, okay, we each get four bucks, in which case the trust has been reciprocated and you are wise to let P2 do this, or doing something selfish and saying, I'll take four and you only get two, in which case P1 made a mistake in trusting P2. And this kind of game has been very interesting to um, experimental economists in recent years because originally it was sort of portrayed as a condition in which classical economic theory says everybody's selfish and money maximizing. Therefore, of course, P2, with, no, with P1 having no subsequent recourse, would always do the selfish thing. And of course, P1 in the shadow of that would never trust. And yet people do trust and people are interested in why they do sometimes and why trust is sometimes reciprocated and so on. Lisa de Bryan, shown here back in her undergraduate or in her graduate student days, um, had people play trust games against self morphs and other morphs. And an important control in her experiments is that the same faces are self morphs for some subjects and are other morphs for other subjects. But everybody, you know, is, there's, there's a yoked control playing with the same pair of faces, except. This one's a self-morph for me, and that one's a self-morph for you. And what Lisa found was that people would entrust more money um, to the more similar, to the self-morph, although they had no perception, or no articulatable or articulated perception that this face resembled them in any way. Um, Lisa published this paper in Proceedings of the Royal Society while she was a graduate student um, with the title Facial Resemblance Enhances Trust, and she was deluged by publicity. It was the, it was the, it was the most publicized single piece of research out of our psychology department by anybody ever. Um, she had calls from every national radio um, broadcasting company in the English-speaking world, it seemed. Um, and she thought, wow, this science business, this was her first paper. This, this, <laughs> this science business is great. Um, Lisa, is a, Lisa is a research machine. She's probably published 30 papers in Proceedings of the Royal Society since then, and over 100 papers. And uh, she's never had that response again. <laughs> Although, she's done some great work. Moving forward, um, these people are now called participants rather than subjects. You can tell we've moved forward a couple of years. If we want to create a face that um, resembles us, but an opposite sex face that resembles us, you can't simply morph a male and a female face. You end up with something sort of creepily androgynous, and, and that wasn't the point. So the way you go about it is this. You compute a same-sex average, which is a composite of many faces from the same population. Um, and interestingly, the same-sex average is, a nice, is nice looking. And it's, it's an extremely common phenomenon that same-sex averages, the more, the more faces you throw in an average, the better looking the individual becomes and looks better than any of the faces that went in. Um, and you create an opposite sex average from a bunch of guys. And Lisa wanted to do this because she wanted to address possible complaint or, or counter-argument to her nepotistic preferred interpretation of her trust game experiment, which was that there's, there's a well-known familiarity is nice effect in psychology. You show a bunch of non-Chinese speakers a bunch of Chinese characters, and then when you start repeating some of them on the list, they don't notice they're repeating, but they guess they mean something nicer. I mean, there's all sorts of very generalized, weird, um, familiarity is nice effects. And Lisa wanted to, and, and there was the argument that, well, the person who looks a little more like you looks a little more familiar because, you know, you look in the mirror or you're surrounded by kin. So it's just a familiarity is nice effect. She wanted to, con to address that by asking, well, if that were true, then you'd have a sort of generalized, this person's attractive, et cetera, kind of effect. Um, but she wanted to assess whether we might have something more discriminative that sounded more like response to kinship. And the way she did it was 
if you want now to produce an opposite sex, self-resembling individual, what you do is you measure all the distances between the participants' features, all, all the vector difference between the participants' face and the same sex average face, and then apply some fraction of those to distorting the opposite sex average face to produce a self-resembling opposite sex person. So watch the face on the right. It's been transformed into a face that is self-resembling to the participant on the left by moving it, I believe, 40, moving the vector differences, 40% of the vector differences between the participant face and the same sex average face, applying that to the opposite sex average face. And I think you'll agree, I hope you'll agree, that the guy on the right doesn't particularly look like the woman on the left. Um, and again, people don't um, perceive that kinship has happened, although Lisa did have one subject in one experiment say that one of the faces she was shown looked like her brother. Um, but, uh, but in general, there's no you know, close similarity. And the result that Lisa got doing this is interesting. You, making the guy look more like you makes him um, rated more trustworthy and other various nice things, but, but he's rated less hot, less attractive. Um, and which, you know, so she published this under the uh, title of the paper was Trustworthy But Not Lustworthy, um, which, which was making the point that this seems to be functioning like a kinship cue. There's your opposite sex average face. There's the distortion towards self-resemblance. There is the possibility of distorting a face like this in a different direction, towards non-resemblance, um, towards anti-resemblance, towards being less similar. Than the, you can just do, you know, you can do the vector transformation in a different direction. There is an anti-self-resembling face that has departed from the male average in a direction opposite from making him look more like the participant. This is interesting because it could, in a sense, be a manipulation that produces negative relatedness or the perception of negative relatedness. I presented R equals zero as, you know, the bottom of my R scale. But when you think about it, if R equals zero is the probability that another random individual in your interaction neighborhood um, shares a particular allele with you, it is possible that there is systematic negative relatedness, that there are individuals who are less likely than chance or the average individual to, uh, to do so. And my subsequent student, Danny Krupp, has been doing experiments on this. And here's a recent result. I'm sorry if you can't read the axes. Basically, it's a, bunch, it's a ratings on a bunch of uh, positive and negative dimensions mooshed together. Um, the white bars are self-resembling and anti-self-resembling effects move 50% towards the subject and 50% away from the subject. And you get positive attributions about, uh, about self-resembling and negative attributions about anti-self-resembling individuals. The gray bars are the responses of other people to those same faces for which they are neither self nor anti-self-resembling, um, which is an important kind of a control because it's conceivable that when you do anti-self-resembling, you just create faces that look kind of nasty or something. Um, but they don't look nasty to other people. They look nasty to the, uh, to the person doing the rating. This is interesting because it increases the plausibility of the evolution of so-called spite, the possibility that you know, I defined altruism as being willing to incur a cost in order to bestow a benefit on somebody else. But theorists have been interested in the idea about whether it would ever be the case that you would have the evolution of inclinations to be willing to incur a cost in order to impose a bigger cost on someone else, um, so-called spite. And if there are negative relatives, and if negative relatives can be recognized in the community, then the possibility of the evolutionary evolution of spite becomes more um, plausible, which moves me to the last thing I want to talk about, which is kinship mitigating violent conflict. And the reason, although this was the title, the reason this is the last thing I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to talk about it relatively briefly, is because when I submitted the abstract, I thought I'd update my previous work on it, and I find there isn't that much updating to do. Um, I'm going to tell you old stories and show you old data, which some of you have seen before. <laughs> 
I got interested in this topic because coming from a sort of animal behavior perspective and being interested in Hamilton's theory of social evolution and so on, um, the phenomenon of family violence seems a little bit anomalous. Richard Gellies and Murray Strauss are not a couple of sensationalists or crackpots. They are the best known researchers on family violence, um, the sort of leading and most respected researchers on family violence. And they said this um, a number of years ago, the family is the most frequent lo single locus of all types of violence, ranging from slaps to beatings to tortures to murder. Students of homicide are well aware that more murder victims are members of the same family than any other category of murderer-victim relationship. I'm not quite sure why they said that. It depends on your categories, maybe, but certainly there are many, many more homicides between unrelated male rivals than there are within families um, in this country and in the world. Nevertheless, um, if family violence is rampant and serious, it is an interesting puzzle what the heck that's about from the point of view of an evolutionist. And I and uh, my late wife, Margot Wilson, are responsible for all the data that I'll show you here. So there's Margot um, smiling in happier times. And we became interested in this phenomenon. We tried to think about um, ways to ask whether this is true. What's missing from a statement like this? Of, you know, is, well, is there really a lot of family violence out there? A lot compared to what? Um, we need something like a denominator. I mean, of course, you're more likely to kill your relative than somebody on the other side of the world. Um, what, you know, is family, are family relations actually more dangerous sort of per unit opportunity or less dangerous per unit opportunity than other kinds of relationships? And I would argue they're less dangerous per unit opportunity. But how the hell do we get an opportunity denominator? It's a tough question. Well, at the time, we had a data set from the city of Detroit, one year's homicides. And in that one year in Detroit, there were 96 cases in which someone had killed someone who was a member of the same household. And this gives us an opportunity to create an opportunity denominator if you've got household survey. Who the heck lives with whom? How many potential murder victims in the same home are there in various kinds of categories? And I will show you data for the city of Detroit on this point. Um, homicides per million potential victims. A potential victim is a co-resonant of a person um, over the age of 14, which is the age at which Americans begin to kill each other at appreciable rates. Um, and you know, the average adult by that definition has 0.7 co-resonant spouses. Um, that is to say, has a 70% problem probability in Detroit at this time of living with a partner, and so on. Um, and the non-relatives are like roommates and people living together for some reason, even though they have no kinship relation. What you find is that, first of all, there's, there's you know, just looking within households and, in some sense, equalizing access in that sense. The people who are at risk are the non-blood relatives, the spouses, and, and spousal homicide I could give another talk that's very long about, um, and other non-relatives. Um, these, they, the, at the bottom is the perpetrator's relationship to the victim. So the smaller bar for child is child killing parent. The larger bar for parent is parent killing child. Interestingly, because the population at large data that we had did not discriminate things like step and in-law relationships, we've included them in the related category. In fact, there were eight cases in this sample of a kid killed by a, a parent, but four of those eight were step-parent homes. And, uh, and so that raised the interesting question about you know, this is kind of a conservative test of what I'm talking about in a way. Um, is there excess risk to stepchildren? Well, without belaboring it, I will say yes, there is. And these Canadian data um, are not atypical. There is a very large um, excess risk to stepchildren at the hands of genetic parents. And I've made something of a minor career of assessing you know, possible confounds and reasons why this might not reflect step relationship, but might reflect something else. And without um, going into that, I'll just say that step relationship remains um, an exceedingly important risk factor um, for violence against children. It's often the case that 
step relationships are formed in contexts in which the step parent wants the new partner, but the kid comes along as unwanted baggage. And uh, by no means always, and I'm sorry if I'm um, raising the hackles of step parents in the audience, but statistically, this is an extremely important risk factor. In any event, back to the question of denominators or opportunity, how to equate opportunity. The other approach we took was this. We looked for data in which you could compare collaborative killers to victim-killer relationships. And there's this lovely old monograph by J.B. Given in which he gives um, large numbers of homicide cases investigated in the 13th century England. And homicide was a cooperative affair in 13th century England. And a large proportion of cases involved two or more people getting together to kill somebody. So you can look at victim-killer relationships and compare them to co-killer relationships. And if sort of conflict and cooperation arise just in proportion to social opportunity and availability, you may expect these distributions to be similar. But they're not. They're very different. Victim-offender relationships are much less often involve relatives, 6% of the compared to 20. And when you break out who those relatives are, only a third of them, so only 2% of all victim-offender relationships are blood kin, um, whereas three-quarters of the so-called relationships, or 15% of co-offender relationships, are between blood kin. If you want to translate that to a relatedness estimate, what you get is this. The mean relatedness between victim and killer in this data set is apparently estimated at 0.01. The mean relatedness between collaborating killers is estimated at 0.08. That's one case. Margo and I looked for every data set we could find that was not select, a selected subset, but all in homicides known to have occurred in some period and had this kind of information. And we came up with this. The result from 13th century England generalizes, even though there's some very interesting differences. On the left, you have mean victim killer relationship. On the right, mean collaborating killer relationship. There's a lot of variability that's cross-cultural variability that's very interesting. Um, but the relatedness of co-killers greatly exceeds the relationship of victim and killer in every homicide sample we could find. And the interesting cases in which there's a substantial average relatedness between um, killers and their victims tend to be patrilineal societies in, and patrilocal societies in which men have contact with very few people other than their agnatic kinsmen. And there's lots of fratricides in such societies. But interesting, especially fratricides where there's male-male rivalry for who's going to inherit the family farm. But, uh, but even so, co-killer relationship is always substantially higher. And I showed this slide many years ago, and, and Nap Shagnon was in the audience. And he said he went and did the same computation with the Yanomamo data and came up with these estimates um, for Yanomamo data. And I could, I'm sure I could add some other studies to this slide, but I, we needn't. Fratricide happens. There's no question about that. And it's an interesting phenomenon that intense sibling rivalry is, in a sense, a consequence of kin solidarity. Kin own land together. Brothers um, are rivals for the same property, sometimes for the same potential brides, where, where marriage rules are very restricting, um, for the same status. I think it's fair to say that, nevertheless, blood really is thicker than water. And relatedness really does temper conflict net of everything else. Thank you. Time for a few questions. OK. Or comment, or comment, as long as it's polite. <laughs> Fred. I, I'm sure you get a lot of impolite comments. But uh, going back to the uh, uh, killing of uh, where there is a non-related person in the family, 
Over the years, have there been enough data on, uh, presumably, initially it was mostly men killing uh, foster children. What about situations where women come into a home where the male has children? Um, are you, have you collected enough data to see, is, I mean, is that just so, so you're, rare you're that- You're talking specifically about sort of stepfather versus yes. stepmother, stepmother contrasts. Right. Um, you know, part of the reason um, Fred knows, and some of you know, that um, I've published a lot of stuff over a long period of time about analyses of stepfamily um, conflict and discriminative um, disinvestment in stepchildren. Um, we usually leave stepmothers out because they're extremely infrequent in the population for very young children. And that remains true, although it's somewhat less true than it was. If you get very large child abuse samples, um, and part of the reason we've, we went to homicide rather than looking at non-lethal abuse is because there's, there's big worries about reporting biases and non-lethal abuse. Those worries are reduced in the case where a kid is actually killed. Um, but if you go to very large samples of um, abuse, you tend to find that stepmother homes are overrepresented to roughly the same degree as stepfather homes. Um, there's also you know, some self-report data from, from kids and adolescents about how they were treated at home that indicate um, you know, ex el elevated violence in step-parent homes and so on. Those data tend to suggest the same thing, that, uh, that the magnitude of elevated risk at the hands of stepfathers and at the hands of stepmothers is, is, a, is similar. Um, and also, I mean, men and women interact with children, at least in traditional family structures, in slightly different ways. And there's some very interesting work by an economist named Ann Case from Princeton, who, using studies like the Panel Study of Income Dynamics of how people um, dispose of their income. And she tends to find things like there's, there's different effect, there's different kinds of economic discrimination against stepchildren according to whether they're in a stepfather or stepmother household. In a stepfather household, for example, um, they're far less likely to get economic support to go to university if they go than in an equally affluent, equally means genetic parent household. Um, in a stepmother household, they're less likely to have, um, it's a longer interval since they last went to the dentist. Um, the, the, the slope of extra cash spent per kid in the house is lower than in a two genetic parent house home. And there's no impact of stepfathers on that kind of thing. It sounds like the domains in which, the domestic domains within which women exercise authority you can see signs of step maternal discrimination in the domestic domains within men, men exercise authority. You can see signs of step paternal discrimination. Thank you for your very interesting talk. Um, if we become very good at genetic engineering in the next few years, is it should we want to engineer our genomes to be more selectively fit and want our kin to be, or? Is, I mean, is there a simple relationship between relatedness? Is there a point at which we, you wouldn't want to do that? You know, I guess I, guess I have to answer um, from my perspective, no, largely because the main lesson I derive from this is that there is no um, shared interest in these matters, that to the degree that people are evolved nepotists, they've got their pet agendas and their own favorite people and their own things that they want to put forward, and we should be skeptical of the, um, you know, where does the self-interest reside in anybody's notion of, you know, what should be policy, what should be programs, what should be, uh, you know, engineered. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just thinking that, that um, you know, the, the world is a negotiated, uh, the civilized world is hopefully, um, a negotiated compromise between conflicting self-interests. And to the degree that individuals are nepotists, um, that people or any other animal are nepotists, there's a bunch of conflicting nepotistic self-interests out there. And that uh, in the absence of some um, 
elevated, detached, principled um, <laughs> arbitration among their various claims, um, any system instituted by human beings to try and regulate, you know, who breeds, what offspring are like, etc., cetera, is, um, is just going to be vulnerable to self-interested abuse. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. I, I really uh, appreciated the kind of range of, of things that it covered. And I, I have a couple of questions, but I'm, I'm going to just pick one. Um, and it's about the, the kind of morphed pictures um, um, and about sort of what, what kin recognition, in a sense, means. It, taken in its kind of larger sense of simply uh, there being a mechanism of um, Allowing an organism to differentiate uh, kin from non-kin and not necessarily being conscious of that of that mechanism, um, if a face is morphed so that it looks more similar to the to the participant, uh, him or herself, uh, there are a number of reasons why why such a face might appear more trustworthy. And one is resemblance to self, and therefore the possibility of having, uh, in some some conscious level, recognized genetic relatedness or the potential for genetic relatedness. The other is that they look like um, r relatives, right, who actually... I um, uh, mean, they simply connote a familiar relative. No, so I actually don't mean familiarity. So I'm, I'm not talking about the kind of Chinese character type experiment, but the fact that if a family has functioned the way that we tend to hope that families function, then people have been doing nice things for you your entire life who look a certain way. Right, and so you may associate the traits of those people with. Yes. So there are a couple of ways one could control, control for that. One would be to deal with um, adoptive uh, um, units and to use not the self morphing, but yep. morphing of ra you know families that yep. raise. Yep. Yep. The other one, which might be interesting in the context of the other thing that you talk about, would be to differentiate between families where people weren't nice to each other and families where people were nice to each other and see if in an abusive um, yes. family, uh, those children have the same kind of trustworthy um, reaction to faces that look like a parent than in, in families where there wasn't abuse. Students in the audience, there are some PhD theses in, in <laughs> Stephanie's question. Um, the, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. Lisa de Bryan is herself an adoptee. She was very interested in um, the sort of issues of kin recognition and whether one would respond to similarity to your adoptive parents. As far as I know, she's, you know, in, in the enormous amount of work she's done in the last 10 years, she, she hasn't got around to doing that one, and it's an interesting question. It's analogous to the question of the cross-fostering of the ground squirrels, and then you, you know, um, but I don't know if that even has been taken to the point of are you therefore nicer to relatives of those who were fostered into your litter as well, because you've picked that up as a kinship cue. There is one really interesting recent experiment, and again, this is something that's so strange to me that I want to see it replicated before I can quite believe it, but an Italian psychologist named Paola Bresson has done these facial resemblance kinds of experiments using as subjects identical twins, monozygotic twins, and monozygotic twins are different enough in their faces that she gets both their faces and she morphs a resemblance to self or to monozygotic twin. And her expectation, I think, was that, you know, the twin is probably who you've got your kinship cue from. You know, how the heck do you know what your face looks like? People are fond of saying, none of this facial stuff makes any sense. There weren't any mirrors in ancestral environments. What's going on? Anyway, Paola's result is a significant preference for and more positive relations to something that's been morphed to your own face than something that's been morphed towards your identical twin's face. And the differences are incredibly subtle. When you look at these things, you can hardly tell the bloody difference between them. And so, um, you know, what this business of self, qua self-resemblance is about is very interesting. And whether this somehow trumps any sort of kin template that has been extracted from who you grow up with, I don't know. There's, 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 there's excellent questions in that domain. Um, and then the question of, of kin, you know, are, are is our positive reactions to kinship cues different according to your experience with your kin is also a wonderful question. I have another former student, Catherine Salmon, who's done a bunch of work on birth order. And 
she was interested in the idea that firstborns and lastborns are better invested in the middleborns. Middleborns are sort of the neglected birth order in families of three or more. And there was already quite a bit of data on things like that middleborns are less likely to get support from their parents to go to university than our first or last um, net of socioeconomic differences and so on. Catherine did these studies where she, she asked, um, like, who is the one person in the world you're closest to? A huge proportion of firstborns say mom. A substantial proportion, approximately half of lastborns say mom. And 10% of middleborns said mom. Um, it, was, it was a massive difference. That pattern's been replicated in other countries, although it's much less dramatic where it's been replicated. I think we sort of fluked into something with these Canadian undergraduates the first time. But Catherine's also shown things like that if you use a kinship metaphor in a political speech, it makes the political speech more persuasive for firstborns and lastborns and makes it less persuasive for middleborns. Um, so, you know, they, they got to do these kinds of experiments in relation to birth order, never mind the, the, the sort of dramatic contrasts you're talking about where your family has been supportive versus abusive, but they got to do them there too. You've got to do them there, the students in the audience. Um, so, given that individuals can kind of tell the relatedness based on appearance, um, I was wondering, do you have any input as to why humanity has kind of developed um, a philosophical desire for altruism when we could potentially discriminate? Well, if, if, if the question is why, you know, a, a philosophical desire, another way to put it is that um, part of the negotiated business of living in society is the, um, the advocacy and, and respect for principles of not letting personal self-interest run rampant in competition with other people's self-interest. The, you know, we revere, idealize, um, make a big deal of acts of altruism um, directed towards non-relatives, um, to some extent equivalent acts directed towards relatives are taken for granted as only to be expected or something like that. But, uh, but I, think, I think there's no great puzzle in why it should be a social convention that it would be desirable if people were nicer to everybody else than they seem spontaneously inclined to be and, and, and if that, that you know, such moral principles should be advocated and to some extent adhered to because you want to live in society, you want to have a reputation as a decent human being, you want to have a reputation in your interactions with non-kin for being um, somebody who is sensitive to other people's interests, who is not merely you know, um, a self-indulgent psychopath. Um, you know, none of those things seem too surprising to me given that we've got a, given that we've got a complexly social species who has to get along with with a larger universe of acquaintances. We have, we have time for just one more question. Um, then we're going to have a break until 10.45. So if you haven't had a chance to have bagels or coffee, you can go out there and get some. Please come back uh, at 10.45 for our next speaker. Um, and I want to uh, let everybody know that there is a round table this afternoon after all the talks. So if you haven't asked your question yet, um, first of all, you can do it over coffee and bagels. Or you could hang on until this afternoon and ask it of the larger group. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, you gave a slide, a slide about Romulus and Remus. It made me think of Cain and Abel. Okay, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when I worked at the prison for four years, there were a lot of brothers there who were there uh, because they had committed offenses together. And there were quite a few sons and fathers who had committed offenses together. So they cooperated like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, no, I mean, I'm very much in analogous to what I was saying about the um, collaborative homicides, the co-offender relationship versus the uh, victim-killer relationship, it is certainly more typical to find um, brothers and father-son acting in concert in conflict situations than to find them acting against each other, although you do find both. Thank you very much. <laughs>